Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Little Dudes Insect Academy podcast. I'm super excited to be here in Washington, D.C. with my friend Ellie, and we're going to talk about bugs, and it's going to be so awesome. So, uh, welcome to the show, Ellie. I'm so excited to have you. So, go ahead and introduce yourself. Awesome. Excited to be here. My name's Ellie, and I am a graduate student at Northern Illinois University, and I get to study houseflies. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, so we're going to get in, into that a little bit more in a minute, but... Before we do that, uh, where did you go to school? You mentioned you were currently working on your graduate degree, right? Yes. So I had a little bit of an interesting path Mm -hmm. for my undergraduate degree. So I started off at Oregon Institute of Technology, now called Oregon Tech, in Klamath Falls, Oregon, where I grew up. Very cool. And then I transferred uh, to Illinois State University about halfway through. Okay. Um... And at Illinois State University, I was able to uh, get to take some really awesome classes, including an ecology class. Okay. And during that ecology class, it was awesome because I had a person in the front row of that class just turn around and ask me, do you want to work with bumblebees? That's awesome. Yeah. So where did that lead? Where, 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 Where did that go? So, of course, it's a fuzzy, beautiful, wonderful insect. And I said, yes, yes, I do. Yeah. And I had been more on like a nursing track or a medical track before then. Okay. And so I went ahead and I joined this insect lab of rearing bumblebees. And the lab uh, looks at the interaction between uh, bumblebees, microbes, their environment, and pesticide use. Wow. And so it just was an awe inspiring experience. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. So, uh,. Okay, so now what are you working on now with your graduate? Have you been working on any cool projects with that? Uh, Yes, so after I graduated from uh, Illinois State University, I went ahead and had an internship uh, working with mosquitoes, oddly enough. Okay. And there I got to meet someone who worked with houseflies, and I started my graduate degree uh, working on houseflies and their natural enemies. So now I kind of go and look into housefly control and different ways to control houseflies that don't require as many of those traditional chemical pesticides, mm. but still diminish the rates of annoyance and disease spread. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, with the houseflies, what are you sort of finding, or are you are you there yet? So I'm not exactly there yet. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the most interesting things and mm-hmm. also a little frustrating things yeah. is just finding those small avenues that will be effective for maintaining low levels of house fly populations mm. uh, that is also cost effective for agricultural workers. Okay. So there yeah. can be effective solutions but if they cost so much money that it would be better just to use something else or to just leave the house flies as is mm-hmm. that's not a very attainable that's not a very good solution yeah yeah so why is it important to sort of control the populations of house flies like why is that important to us so for the for agriculture um, house flies actually can spread diseases mm. including um, things like cholera it used to be a huge issue really uh, before we were able to kind of knock down levels of cholera in the United States yeah uh, but it's also known to spread like E. coli and salmonella mm-hmm. uh, there's also chlamydia that it mm. can spread and there was a recent paper uh, out of the Natoch lab in Kansas State University where they really? looked and found that house flies can actually transmit through mechanical vectoring mm. so they land on a surface and then it can spread that uh, microbe elsewhere. Really? They can actually spread COVID-19. Wow. And wow. so they can spread disease just by landing on filth and then landing somewhere else. <laughs> wow. Just from their feet or something. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, very interesting. And and they're in every American home, right? They are ubiquitous. So they can yeah. be they are cosmopolitan species, so they don't like their fancy drinks at midnight, whatever. Right. <laughs> uh, but yes. they are found in essentially almost every continent and every country in the world. Wow. And they're also a really cool insect because we can rear them in the lab for mm. not a lot of money. Right, yeah. And they're so sim- so similar to other uh, filth flies, so other flies that depend on filth. 
yeah. that we can use them as a model for those right. other flies. So things like stable flies that will bite mm-hmm. and require blood to rear in a lab, mm-hmm. or things like horn flies or face flies, which can be difficult to rear in the lab. Yeah. And so we can translate that to other fly control problems. Mm. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so, um, so how did you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, that person in your class who asked you about bumblebees, but how did you originally, like, was there a turning point where you were like, yeah, insects is where I want to go. Like, um, entomology is what I want to do. Was there a moment or was it kind of gradual? So... When I was really little, I was the odd child. Right. And so I love snakes. Mm -hmm. I always wanted a pet snake. Yeah. Um, And I love the creepy crawlies. Yeah. And so I was was the one outside and looking for the random stuff. Yeah. And so I had that interest in the unloved animals. And insects are some of the most unloved animals that we have out there. Right. And I mean, for good reason. Yeah. Mosquitoes are not exactly your best friend. Not great, yeah. And I mean, bed bugs, cockroaches, they're not exactly models of friendly behavior. They sort of overshadow the good ones, yeah. Yes. Um, but it's that, that always that interest in just the odd and the peculiar. Yeah. And for a while, after I was hospitalized, when I was uh, six, with osteomyelitis, uh, so a really bad bone and muscle infection, I kind of switched my fascination to, like, medical. Mm -hmm. And that fascination held until I was in that classroom with that student who turned and asked if I wanted to be with bumblebees. And I'm, like, going, yeah, this is cool. And then to top that, there was also a rainforest ecology class that I took. Oh, cool. And... Because of IOCUC, so the ethical board for the treatment of animals, mm-hmm. uh, those regulations are pretty strict for good reasons. Yeah. Uh, insect work was a lot easier to do. Right. And so for that rainforest ecology class, I did an insect project. Mm-hmm. And then it just kept snowballing. And I took an entomology class. I had so much fun and learned so much. Mm. And I was able to get into that mosquito internship that led to my current and my current graduate position. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So, um, who who kind of inspired you? Um, I mean, other than that student, but like, do you have any other big inspirations in the world of science or otherwise? Um, like, who's your inspiration, if anybody? So one of my inspirations is uh, Nellie Stevens, and I'm hoping I'm remembering her name right. Uh, Mm -hmm. She was a geneticist uh, in the early, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, who worked on the theory of uh, chromosomes uh, determining sex. Right. So she actually worked in Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab. Wow. And was the one who kind of started cluing him in on, hey, I'm noticing this pattern. Uh, Yeah. I think this is what's going on. And yeah. so I think that her work was just super cool. Wow. Uh, there's also an entomologist, and I'm so horrible with names, I'm so yeah. sorry. Uh, but he was this fascinating uh, person who worked with the 17 year cicadas, the periodical cicadas. Yeah. And he was the one who noticed that they came up in that periodic cycle. And that odd, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, okay. So some entomologists, a geneticist. Yeah, very cool. Um, so what are some um, other f- uh, otherwise from um, entomology, or they might be related, we kind of see it creeping into our everyday, but um, what are some other kind of hobbies that you like to enjoy on um, in your spare time? Well, I do enjoy music, so I sing badly, but <laughs> I have a ton of fun doing it. Yeah. Um, I also play trombone, also mm-hmm. badly, but again, a ton of fun Very doing fun. it. Very fun, yep. I also like sewing. Uh, okay. And it's more of something that I do for that little bit of creative edge because I notice that science is so much creativity. Yeah. And I love that it's just not that two plus two equals four. Yeah. It has that bit of creativity. Right. Actually, the dress that I'm wearing right now is one that I sewed. Very cool. So. That's a great skill to have. Yeah, for sure. So useful. Yeah. Very cool. Anything else? Um, I also bake some. Okay. uh, But. 
I'm still working out from moving from a high altitude climate to oh, a yeah. very flat climate, how to make the adjustments. It makes a difference, right? Oh, it makes a huge difference. And really? unfortunately, I haven't quite figured it out yet. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't really think about that. That's that's really cool. Um, yeah. So what are some of your like goals and aspirations and maybe trips or research that you want to do in the future? Are you looking at maybe a PhD or it might be too soon to ask you that, but um, kind of what are your aspirations for the future? So I would love to become an instructor uh, and stay in academia as like a tenure track professor, Okay. Uh, mostly on a teaching focused track. So maybe a PUI or so a primarily undergraduate institution mm-hmm. or possibly like a community college okay just because i love teaching yeah i also love research yeah so the research that i'm interested in doing is more of a collaborative approach yeah and research that i can do with undergraduate students so one of the issues that comes up is that for my institution right now is that we have a lot of commuter students we have Mm. a lot of students that have part-time jobs right like within our department like 70 percent or something of those students have a part-time job and work like 20 hours a week wow and to do that and expect them to do undergraduate research in a lab on top of heavy coursework right they can't do that yeah so it puts them at a distinct disadvantage for when they're trying to apply for graduate schools or try to apply for jobs right. or these professional programs. Yeah. And so I love the idea of undergraduate research in a class where you take in the class anyway. Yeah. And you all are doing science. Yeah. Let's do something that we can possibly publish and get you on that road. And that goes on their resume too. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Great idea, yeah. I think that's a great approach to your solution to teaching, but also you want to do your own research too. So I think that's a really great middle ground. um, And I think that would really work. So that would be really cool. Oh, I do have to mention that I've been able to be a part of a really great project at... Okay. Uh, through NIU, through my teaching as a TA, mm-hmm. uh, called the Fly Cure. Uh, Dr. Okay. Jacob Kagey at the University of Detroit Mercy, Michigan, has actually spearheaded this project. Okay. And it's a genetics research project in a genetics lab, or it can be generalized to like a whole bunch of different types of classes. Right. It's even been implemented in community colleges, mm. where students characterize and map uh, muta- uh growth mutations in Drosophila melanogaster or that yeah. fruit fly. Yeah. And right now, I think just at NIU, there have been like three publications, uh, micro publications, but three publications that have come out of that. So wow. I have to plug fly cure when I can. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, fruit flies are always being used because, you know, short lifespan, all that kind of stuff, super cheap to, to, to reproduce, but very cool. And, and do those serve as a um, example um, species like what you talked about with the house fly or yeah so Drosophila melanogaster is like one of your perfect model organism examples yeah uh, actually there's a booth uh, down in the student tables that have a sticker that says lab animal and it's the Drosophila melanogaster yeah and so it's just in it's just one of those peak model organisms cheap right. easy to rear and there are so many different strains. Yeah, very awesome. Yeah, so um, before we wrap up, um, where can the viewers go to sort of learn more about you? Do you have maybe social media or website maybe, or maybe just your lab uh, website or, um, you know, where can we go to learn more about you? So, unfortunately, I'm really bad with the social media side of things. I totally get that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you're interested in learning more about house flies and their control, I'm happy to email with you. Uh, my email is ehart3 at niu.edu, uh, ehart3 at niu.edu. And so I'm always happy to answer your housefly related questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll point you in a direction to find it. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much for being on the show, Ellie. This was really fun. Um, yeah, this was super awesome. So um, you did great. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for doing this. Best of luck at your conference.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Little Dudes Insect Academy podcast. If you enjoyed it, definitely consider dropping a follow on whatever platform you're listening on. And also, uh, Little Dudes Insect Academy is a nonprofit organization. So if you're passionate about uh, science communication, entomology, outreach, and education, and you enjoy what we're doing and how we're solving that um, gap, then consider uh, heading over to our website and donating there or becoming a monthly donor via our Patreon, which is also linked in the show notes of this episode. Yeah, so share this episode with one of your friends and tune in next week. I will see you all next week. And with that, keep on bugging.